Good morning, church. All right, let's try that again. Good morning, church. All right, if you guys would, go ahead and stand up with me. I'm going to read our call to worship this morning. This is out of Matthew 7, verses 7 through 11. It says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks for him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for giving us all this opportunity to come into your house. Uh, Lord, I, uh, I just pray for this message that's about to be delivered. Lord, I pray that it touches someone's heart. Lord, I pray that as we lead worship, that the things that we play and the things that we see sing uh, lead someone closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you guys turn around and tell somebody that you're happy to see them this morning. There's honey in the rock, purpose in your plan, 
Jesus, oh, how sweet, how sweet it is to trust in you, Jesus, oh, how sweet, how sweet it is to trust in you, Jesus. All right, you guys can have a seat. Good morning, Burlington Baptist Church. Beautiful morning, isn't it? Oh, it beats what we've come through. I told them in the first service, we have good news and we have bad news. The good news is it's a beautiful day outside. The bad news is next Sunday, it will be 11.51 at this time. So don't forget to set your clock, spend your week making up that extra hour of sleep, whatever you got to do. But don't miss church next Sunday. That's not an excuse just because they haven't fixed the time change yet. But uh, it is a glorious day to be in the church. If you're a guest today, we want to say welcome to you. Um, it is just a pleasure to have you join us for worship today. If you are a guest, just to ask that you take a moment either to scan that QR code that should be in the chair or one of the chairs in front of you and just uh, it provides you a little window on your phone to give us some information about you, give us a chance to meet you a little bit. If you don't want to do that, that's absolutely fine. Definitely stop back by our guest services desk. It's out in the foyer to the left-hand side. And give us a chance to get to meet you personally and just welcome you. But it's a, just always great to have new people joining us for worship today. So uh, just if you need anything, don't hesitate to ask. That's what we're here for. A couple of things going on this week just to make you aware of. Uh, tomorrow night at 6.30, we're going to be having a Sunday School Still Matters workshop um, from the KBC. It's going to be here at the church. We're hosting that. So if you want to come and be a part of that, you don't have to be a teacher. You don't have to be a co-teacher, uh, vice teacher, whatever you call it in your class. You don't have to be anybody but just a student. Or if you've got any questions about Sunday School and how it's still relevant today and all the things that you can take up, Give us a call tomorrow in the office tomorrow morning so we can make sure you're signed up to be a part of that. But we're looking forward to hosting that. Also, I wanted to announce that we're beginning of March, so we are in the beginning stages of our Annie Armstrong offering. And this year our goal is $8,500. Last year you guys were tremendous with that. You gave $11,000 to Annie. And Annie supports the North American Mission Board and all the ministries that go along with that. Um, it supports our partner program that's out in Utah at our church that we partner with in Morgan, Utah. And right here in Northern Kentucky, it houses and helps um, several of the ministries that go on. Um, one down at Southside Baptist Church that we're actually going to be a part of this year with doing Easter baskets, and you're going to get information about that. Annie also helps pay for those missionaries that are in service there. So just make sure that over this next month that you're praying about that. We want to exceed that goal and be able to support the ministries that are going on in North America because I think that a lot of times we forget uh, we need Jesus in this country. Amen? Amen? So let's help spread the word and make sure that that word is getting spread. Last thing I want to draw your attention to is we're going to be having a worship night and we're going to be having a potluck. And what we need from you over the next uh, couple of weeks as we get ready for that is to sign up with your favorite side dish, come and worship on that night of worship, and eat your Baptist. You know how to do that? So uh, I told them, it, I made the mistake in the first service, but I have to do it for you guys too now. I told them, I said, I still have some cookbooks left over from when I was doing student ministry. I probably got about 15 or 20 of them now left because I got hit up after the first service. Some of the wonderful saints that have gone on before us, they left us their uh, recipes years ago. So I have those. And if you want a copy of the cookbook because you don't know what side item to bring, see me and I'll see if I can't get you a cookbook, okay? Happy to do it. Absolutely free. And actually it'd be nice because that'd be one box I empty in my office. So uh, if you want a cookbook, just let me know. We are blessed today because we have Reverend Andy McDonald with us today, and he's coming to share. Um, he works down with the KBC, but he's just a wonderful man pouring out his heart to us. And I know that uh, God has blessed us with having the opportunity to have him come and share. And we're looking forward to what you have, brother. And uh, just pray that that touches our heart in a mighty way. want to be in prayer today for our college 
because they're traveling. This is their college spring break week. Jonathan took them out of here at 4.30 this morning. It's kind of why this area is empty a little bit today. I notice a little bit more vacant, but Jonathan and Sarah and uh, several of the college students head out. So be in prayer for them this week. But uh, we are truly blessed here at Church Burlington Baptist with all the things that go on. I'm just going to ask that we join together for a word of prayer as we get ready to get into worship. Father, we thank you for this time, a time when we get to open our doors and just come and fill your house. And Father, it's an opportunity where we get to greet each other and be a part of the body and lean on and pray for one another. But also, Father, it's more importantly a time for us to come to the altar and to you. And we've got so many things to be thankful for in our lives, Father. And some of us have seen that played out. We know that there are people in our community, even in our church, that have had their struggles over these last three weeks. And I just thank you for the way that this church continues, just reaches out in prayer, but also in support, whatever's needed. And we are reminded, Father, that that's the kind of um, leader that you want us to be, one that's there for others and to show your love, and to show your son's love in a mighty way. And Father, as we gathered in this time today, we just ask that you let your Holy Spirit move among us. Whatever we've brought into this place, we lay it at your feet today, Father. We ask you just to take it and put it in a place uh, where it needs to be handled. And let us lean on you for all understanding. Be with our search team in just a little bit. We're going to recognize them the ones that are going to be serving on that search team. And Father, just pray for their work as they begin that process and how you've already know who the pastor is going to be of our church, but uh, you're just going to lead us to that point. We're just so thankful for you. Father, today as we continue in worship, we pray for the ones that we know of and the ones we don't. And we pray uh, that in the time that the praise team now leads us through a time of worship, that we just feel your spirit, just know of your presence. And most of all, Father, thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, because he's the reason why we get to do all this. We pray all in his precious name. Amen. All right, if you guys would, go ahead and stand back up with us. Uh, I'm going to need your help on this next one. We're a bit slim today, so uh, sing loud.
guys can have a seat. So this next song we're gonna sing is called I Surrender. And when I first heard it, the lyrics kind of resonated with me pretty strongly. Um, for the past couple years, I've been praying, you know, God use me, I'm ready, not holding anything back anymore. And um, I started to feel his call in a couple areas. And as soon as I did, I started with the excuses, you know, I'm not good enough for that. Definitely not qualified enough for that. Um, but it's a good thing that God doesn't require either of those things for us to be used. He wants our obedience and our surrender. And so we're going to sing about surrendering everything to Jesus this morning.
Fantastic. Good morning, everyone. It's a joy to be back here with you. My name is Andy. If we haven't had an opportunity to meet, I'm so thankful to be able to be with you, I think, three Sundays, at least in here in March. And uh, you may say, oh, me, but I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, and so uh, I'm also very grateful uh, to be able to bring your uh, search committee here this morning up front. I'm going to invite them to come and stand, if they would, down front. Uh, we did this in the early service, and so we certainly want to uh, repeat it here uh, with you all uh, in this service. Uh, you all are, are the ones that, by uh, God's good grace, following his leadership, uh, felt led to set these good brothers and sisters apart uh, for the task of searching for your next pastor. Uh, now, when we say searching, he's not lost. Uh, and, and God already knows who he wants to be your next pastor, right? We, he already knows that. Uh, but he's going to use uh, these good brothers and sisters and in his timing uh, help them to get to the place where they have identified uh, who that man is. And then, of course, they'll bring them here before you all uh, and you have, you'll have the opportunity to affirm what they believe God has led them to do. And uh, I share with them earlier uh, that God's given them a big job. He's given them a big job, big responsibility. Uh, but God is bigger still. Uh, and uh, I, as I said to you all earlier, I, I've never been on your side of the table. I've always been on the other side of the table when it comes to the search committee. But I have talked to people who have served on search committees. And many of them have said it's one of the highlights of their Christian life. And so... Uh, will you all faithfully pray that it would be so for them, okay? Um, and, and, and also, some helpful things would be, hey, I'm praying for you. I'm so thankful you're in this role. Uh, just know you can count on it. We're at home. We're lifting you up. Uh, that, that would be some helpful things you can say to them. Um, and make sure you're doing it, obviously. Make sure you're praying for them. Some unhelpful things are, when are we getting a pastor? You, you all had not found him yet? Who is it? Who are you getting? Who are you get? Those are not helpful statements. Um, when, when we're done here this morning, we're going to meet together and have lunch, and I'm going to walk through some training, search committee training with them. And I'm going to say it to you all, even if a church member, your friend, or your, or your mama asks you, who, who is it you're looking at, you're going to tell them, just keep praying for us. Just keep praying for us. Uh, and so we, we want to take some time to, uh, to set you all apart. The church has already done that. Uh, but to pray f for you and over you uh, in this very public uh, setting uh, among your brothers and sisters who love you and they're for you uh, and God's for you and this is going to be a good thing uh, by God's good grace. So I'm going to invite you all, if you would, would you stand with them now and uh, just as a, a symbolic gesture of laying on hands, if you don't mind, if you feel comfortable, just extend your hand towards them. Um, and I'm going to pray a, a prayer of blessing uh, and commissioning over them. Father, in, in the name of Jesus, thank you so much uh, for your amazing grace. Never more clearly demonstrated than through our Savior who died on the cross for our sins. And thank you, Lord, that in your infinite wisdom you set apart leaders, men called to pastor churches and and, Lord, this church is beginning that search. And, and, Lord, you set apart these good brothers and sisters to that end. And I just pray, Lord, that this would be one of the most joyful experiences of their walk with you, Lord. I pray, God, that um, you would give them an extra dose of your grace, Lord, as they're going to be away from their families a little bit more than usual. And, Lord, they're going to kind of bear a weight that maybe they don't normally bear. But I pray, Lord, they would... Remember this morning and this symbolic gesture of brothers and sisters extending hand, and that would be a reminder to them that Father, uh, they're, they're not they're not bearing this burden alone, that their church family loves them uh, and is praying for them, and of course, Lord, you are undergirding them by your Spirit's power. Lord, would you give them patience as they work this process? Lord, would you enable them to pray, maybe like never before in their lives, to pray and to rely on you and the power of your spirit to lead them to the man of God. 
And Lord, we just in advance thank you for the good work that you're going to accomplish through them. And look forward to the day when the man of God stands in front of the people of God to lead them for the glory of God. And we ask this prayer in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Amen. Hey, can we give them a round of applause? To thank them. Thank you all. God bless you all. You all can be seated. You can be seated. All right. Well, in the, the three Sundays that um, I, I will be with you, I want to preach a sermon series I call That Kind of Church. And by that, I, I'm trying to describe some foundational truths, some, really to remind you all of some foundational biblical truths and practices of a, a New Testament church. Uh, the things that I want to share with you uh, are true across all of time for every church. Not just the church currently, but the church past. Uh, they lived by these. The church currently is living by those. And, and, and by God's grace, if the Lord tarries, the church is in the future. Th these will still be true for them. They're true across all of time, in every circumstance, in every part of the world. The things that I want to share with you are that foundational uh, to our, our faith and to a New Testament church. And so I hope that as we walk through these, you're going to say, hey, Burlington Baptist, man, we want to be that kind of church. And so, for example, this morning, I want to preach a message called that kind of church where unity is protected where unity is protected. I mean, God takes seriously the unity of His church. He wants you all to stay together in community and to thrive as the community and the people of God. And so I want to just remind you of this. Uh, I, I know a little bit about this church. I've been privileged to be with you a few times. I, I, I know your former pastor bragged on you all the time. And, and it's just obvious that uh, you all are a unified people. But, you know, if you took an egg, I, I don't recommend doing this um, unless you get permission from your mom uh, if you're a kid. But if you take an egg and lay it long ways in your hand, right, and you've got the top of the egg kind of in the pocket of your fingers and the, the bottom of the egg at the base of your palm, and you try and crack that egg, it's, hard. it's doable, but it's really hard, isn't it? It's just really hard. So some of you are going, I'm going to have to try that. Okay, go ahead. Just, you know, put some paper down before you do it. But, but if you turn that thing, if it gets sideways in your hand and you crush it, it's easy. It'll crush it in, in, with no problem. So if a church gets sideways with each other, man, the enemy moves in and conflict can, can arise and it can cause disunity in the church. And so... My message for you all this morning from the Word of God is to be that kind of church where unity is protected. So if you have your copy of God's Word, I invite you to turn to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. And it will also be on the screen. The Apostle Paul under the inspiration of the Spirit, writes, Therefore I, the prisoner in the Lord, urge you to walk worthy of the calling you have received, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope at your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. I, I love to preach Ephesians because it's already sort of outlined for the preacher when you come to preach through this letter that Paul wrote to some believers at Ephesus. Chapters 1 and 3 describes who we are in Christ, and then 4 through 6 describe how we should live because of who we are. Some said 1 through 3 is like Bible doctrines, and then 4 through 6 is Bible duties, our responsibility. Or 1 through 3 can be described as our wealth, and 4 through 6 as our walk with the Lord. Now, how many of y'all as parents ever said to your, especially your teenage kids as they're getting ready to leave the house, remember whose you are? Anybody ever said that? 
Anybody had that said to them? Remember whose you are. Uh, and, and I think that's important for us as believers when we think about maintaining and protecting the unity of the church. We need to remember who we are in Christ. I love Jeremy Morton. He, he's a pastor of a church down in Georgia. He said when he was a teenager, his parents would say something similar to that. Remember whose you are. And then they would quote, quote Proverbs thirty seventeen to him. Now, I don't know if you know what's in Proverbs thirty seventeen, but here's what it says. The eye that mocks a father and scorns to obey a mother will be picked out by the ravens of the valley and eaten by the vultures. Have a nice time, son. <laughs> Some of y'all are going to break that down right now. That was <laughs> Proverbs thirty seventeen. Remember whose you are. And then because of who you are, here's how we should live. That's what Paul is describing as he begins chapter 4. And one of the things that he describes is a worthy calling. Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk worthy of the calling you have received. Paul, Paul is, is saying that, that because I followed the calling of Christ in my life, it's led me to these chains. Now, I wouldn't trade it for the world, Paul is saying, but it costs something to follow Jesus. I've paid a price to pursue God's calling in my life. And all of you have been called by God. There's kind of the universal calling where God extends the gospel to sinners and those who hear it and repent and believe are saved. That's the universal calling that God graciously makes to the world. But then there's, there's kind of a, a, a more specific call, and that's where God will call some to be set apart as ministers uh, in the church, pastors and missionaries, worship pastors, children ministers and, and youth ministers, people like that who have been set apart. But listen, even if that's not you, you still have been called by God to serve the Lord Jesus and to extend the gospel. Every Christian has a calling on their lives. And Paul is saying, Walk worthy of that calling. You know, if you've been saved, man, it, God did it for you all by means of the cross, didn't he? Salvation is full and free. Jesus paid the price for Christians. Uh, being saved is not what I do. It's what's been done for me in Christ. But if you follow Jesus, it'll cost you everything. It almost sounds like a, a, a oxymoron, doesn't it? But if you follow Jesus, he's calling you and I to lay down our lives for the sake of the gospel. So, in other words, in light of the price that's been paid for you and I to know Jesus and to be saved, Paul's saying pursue his calling on your life. That's part of the, the worthy calling. And man, listen. There's nothing better than to pursue God's calling in your life. And if you're not sure what that means or what that looks like, then, then find a, another more mature brother or sister or one of your staff members here and just say, man, I, I'm kind of wrestling with that. I heard that guy talk about calling, and I'm just not sure what that means. Get with them. They'd be glad to walk with you and to help you understand from the Scriptures what it means to follow God's calling for your life. Because here's a question that I think is important, and that's this. Are you passionately pursuing your calling in Christ, or are you kind of just going through the motions? Man, if you want to experience the joy of the Christian life, start following Jesus and his call on your life. Now, it's going to lead you to some scary places, right? You're going to be way out on that limb, uh, trusting the Lord by faith. But that's the best place to be. Follow your worthy calling. And then Paul kind of describes a worthy character. Verse 2, with all humility and gentleness, with patience. He's describing the characteristics of those who follow Jesus. Notice there's nothing here about being high-powered and in charge, CEO. Man, you know, nothing wrong if you're, if you're in that role at a corporation. You need people like that. But for the, for the church, man, the worthy character is marked by humility and gentleness and patience. Being humble means to, to put God first and others second and yourself last. Humility is not self-pity. It's rightly understanding who we are before a holy God and being humbled by 
that. Warren Wearsby said, hum- humility is knowing ourselves, accepting ourselves, and being ourselves for the glory of God. Now, if someone were to say to you, do you understand what it means to be a humble person? And you were to say, yeah, I am. I'm pr- I guess I'm pretty much the most humble person I know. Um, no, probably not. We need, we need some more work in that area, right? Uh, a lot of Christians sound like operas, don't they? Me, 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 me. Uh, we need to, that was not a good joke at all. Wasn't it? That one just landed really flat. Don't ever do that again, right? But are you humble? Are you a humble person? Is your life marked by humility? And then he says to be gentle. Uh, it's meekness is another way to translate the word meekness. Not weakness, it's strength under power. Jesus was gentle and lowly in heart. He describes his heart in Matthew's gospel. The one and only time he describes his heart. And when Jesus does, he says, I am gentle and lowly of heart. I mean, the King of glory, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus, the Son of the living God, when he wanted to reveal his heart, he said, I'm gentle and lowly of heart. And he's saying, I think to you and I, you need to be the same. You need to be gentle. That's part of the worthy character. And then he says, uh, Paul says, be patient. When you think about the worthy calling and living that out by a worthy character, be patient. And being patient means to endure discomfort without fighting back. To endure discomfort without fighting back. And, And I know, man, if you're like me, I struggle with patience. That's one of those things that the Lord just continually kind of hauls me back uh, to and, and, to, and, and continues to work on me to help me to be a more patient person. I, I will say to my three sons who are all adults now, I'm, one of my greatest regrets, I said this to my oldest son recently, one of my greatest regrets is that I wasn't more patient with you boys. And he said, ah, Dad, you, you did a good job. He was gracious towards me. But I don't know if anybody else has ever felt that way. That, that's one of my regrets, just to be more patient with my children. And, and that's really important when you think about unity in the church, to be patient with one another, uh, to not be ready to be offended or, or to, to, to strike back when somebody maybe does something uh, that you don't like. Be patient with each other. That's part of that worthy character. Then we're going to see these worthy practices, the rest of verse 2 and on into 3, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And so he's talking about this patient love. It's it's really a heart thing, isn't it, when we're talking about bearing with one another, Um, not ready to be offended. Uh, A lot of times when we get offended at people, uh, it's because we've heard something that may or may not be true and because we don't know the full story we start filling in the blanks don't we and I've just noticed in my life when I start filling in the blanks when I don't have complete information and I just make some assumptions filling in the blanks I almost always get the blanks wrong have you ever noticed that how much much time and effort do we spend worrying and being upset with someone uh, without ever talking to them and this is saying, be, be patient, bear with one another in love. Give people the benefit of the doubt. Give people the benefit of the doubt. And if you're not sure, go, go to them and just say, you know, um, this happened and, 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 and I may have misunderstood and I just want to clear the air here. Can we just talk about this? I love you. I know you love me. We're... we're we're brothers in Christ or sisters in Christ, and I just want to I just want to work this out. Be patient. Bear with one another in love. Love is that that driving force of every Christian uh, Christian's life. And those of you that are more mature, especially, you, you need to bear with those who are less mature. I think about newborn babies, and newborn babies pretty much eat, sleep, poop, and cry. I mean, that's what they do most of the time. That's kind of their job. And so when you get newborn believers in the life of a church, they can be messy, right? And if we're not careful, we can easily discourage them by an unkind and harsh word. 
And Paul's saying, bear with one another in love. Be patient with each other. And then he says, uh, do this in the power of the Holy Spirit. Maintain the unity of the Spirit. It's unity that belongs to the Spirit. In other words, the kind of unity that Paul is describing is impossible for human beings to do apart from living in the power of the Holy Spirit. Walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. Keeping in step with the Holy Spirit. He is our power source. We can't do this apart from Him. And so when we maintain the unity of the Spirit, we're going to think about the, the things that matter to the heart of God before we think about our own selfish desires. It's, it's living out the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Uh, Galatians chapter 5, 23 and 24 says, that's the fruit of the Spirit. And when you and I keep in step with the Spirit, we're going to bear His fruit towards one another. Listen, you know this? It's impossible to bear the Spirit's fruit and still be a divisive person. If you're bearing the, the Spirit's fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, you can't at the same time be a divisive person. And so when you and I keep in step with the Spirit and, and are eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit, here's the result of that. There's peace among the people of God. You experience the peace of God. How many of y'all are excited about the peace of God in your life and in this church? Man, by God's good grace, you're there, aren't you? But just know that the enemy will move in in a, in a, in a, in a moment's notice if he's given an opening and he'll try and sow disunity. So you got to keep in step with the Spirit. And then Paul gives us what I would describe these pictures of unity. Uh, one body, the, the body of Christ. Uh, you were placed into the, the body of Christ the moment you were saved. And then the Spirit of God led you to join your life to a local expression of the body of Christ like Burlington Baptist Church. And let me just ask you, if, if you're here and you've been coming here for a while, man, you're like, you, you've walked around the showroom looking at a car, you kicked the tires, opened the door, worked all the bells and whistles. If that's you and you've been here for a while, this is, this is where you need to land, right? Uh, this is it. You found it. Now join your, your life to it. That's, that's God's plan for your life is to be joined to a local expression of the body of Christ like Burlington Baptist. And if you've been coming here, this, is, this, this needs to be your church family. And we're, gonna, we're not there yet, but when we get to an invitation time, man, we would love for you to come forward. And uh, there will be here, folks here. I'll, I'll be glad to pray with you, but there will be folks here that will, that will kind of take your name, do some Baptist paperwork, I think, and, uh, and, and, and the church will affirm you as a, a member uh, of this church. It's that, and I'm going to talk more about church membership next week. But there's one body. There's one spirit given to you when you were born again. Uh, the spirit is mentioned at least a dozen times in Ephesians. And walking in the spirit, that's one of the key uh, concepts of Ephesians. Walking in the spirit, that's the only way to live the Christian life. There's one spirit, one hope. Uh, our, our faith is in the Lord Jesus. And I think that Paul is actually describing the second coming of Christ when he returns uh, to take his bride home with him. Now, I've heard Christians say this. Uh, they'll say, or, or, or people, not necessarily Christians, but I, I think I've heard some Christians say this. You know what? I can't wait to get to heaven because i got some questions for God. Have you ever heard anybody say that before? <laughs> like there's going to be this lineup of Baptists outside God's door waiting to ask him some questions. Can I just tell you, that, that's not going to happen. <laughs> One millisecond in heaven, uh, you're, you and I are just going to praise the Lord and give glory to the King forever and ever and ever. And every question you ever had will just dissolve into joy unspeakable with our Father in heaven and the Lord Jesus. That's, that's the hope that you and I have. It's a sure 
hope in Christ. There's one Lord, Jesus. He's the one who rescued us by means of the cross. He, he, was, he was killed for our sins on that cross and buried and rose again. And man, in him, you can have life eternal. And if you're here this morning or maybe you're watching online and, and there's never been a place in your life where you understood, man, okay, I, I'm a sinner. I get that now. And I can't fix my sin problem. I can't wash it away, but Jesus did it for me through the cross with his own blood. Yeah, that's how it happened. And if you're here and you've never trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then man, when we do that invitation, you don't even have to wait. You can just tune me out right now and you can pray and cry out to Jesus, Lord, I'm turning from my sin. I believe in you, you, that you that you died and rose again, and I'm trusting in you as my Lord and Savior. Please rescue me. And he will. But if you do that, we want to encourage you. Please come forward and, and let this church know you've made that decision. And Jesus is worthy, man. He's, he's the Lord. He alone is the Lord. And there's one faith, and that faith is fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Jude Uh, Chapter 1, verse 3 says this, Dear friends, although I was eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I found it necessary to write, appealing to you to contend for the faith that was delivered to the saints once for all. There's only one way for a person to be saved, and that's by putting their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Only Jesus can save. I know that there are other religions out there in the world, but none of them have a Savior who died for them and rose again. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's only one faith, the Christian faith. And and Paul is saying, man, you need to hang on to that one faith. And then he describes one baptism, uh, and that's the baptism of, of of the Holy Spirit when he placed you into the body of Christ. There are some folks that get confused by that, but but that baptism happens once when you're saved, and, and, and there's not another baptism of the Spirit that we're supposed to seek after. It's not an experience we should seek, but something that the Spirit does for us at our new birth. And then we follow the Lord in New Testament baptism, which is a powerful symbol that I belong to Jesus and He lives in me. We are called to be filled with the Spirit, Ephesians 5.18, but never again baptized with the Spirit. One baptism. Then Paul says, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. See, the body of Christ is the family of God and, and God the Father is, Uh, is the Lord, and He's the one that loves His family. He is our Heavenly Father, and He is wonderfully working in His church family. And and I don't know, when you you hear that that word Father, for some of you all, that might conjure up some hurtful feelings. Maybe your earthly father wasn't a good father. You had a bad experience. It was painful. He was absent, or um, it was... A hurtful thing for you but can I just tell you based upon the scriptures and my own experience and the, and the experience of countless other believers that your father in heaven is perfect in all of his ways and he's a good good father and he will never let you down not ever and I hope that that will encourage you this morning when I think about Unity in the church. I think about a church that I served as a a youth pastor several years ago. It's in Henderson, Kentucky, Zion Baptist Church. And and before I ever got there, the pastor, Dan Garland, uh, and the people, uh, they they felt led by God to build a children's building. But the place where it needed to be built, uh, there sat this picnic pavilion. Uh, It was probably, you know, 50, 40, 50 feet long and 30 feet wide or so. It was open on the sides, had a, you know, a pitched roof with shingles on it. It was a nice picnic shelter, and they really enjoyed it. They used it a lot when the weather permitted. Uh, but 
it sat right where they needed to build their new building. And so uh, Brother Dan and the church prayed about it, and he asked certain engineers about it, and they said, man, if you try and bring in a crane and pick that up, you'll break it into multiple pieces. There's no way to do it. And so Dan said, he, you know, he prayed about it, and one night God showed him what to do. God told him, you pick it up. You pick it up. And so they did. Uh, they, they invited the whole church to come out, 300-plus people. They nailed two-by-fours around those posts of that pavilion, and each person got a handhold, and on go, they lifted it up, and they walked it a couple hundred feet to a place where they already had little concrete pads poured for those posts. And when they got over top of those, they lowered it down, and each one of those posts ended up in the middle of that concrete pad. And Dan said, I was reminded that day about what God can do when the people of God are united in the power of God. God can do what everybody else will say is impossible. But it takes unity, unity in community. You know, you can't say community without saying unity, right? Uh, God wants you to live in community. Now, when we're talking about unity in the church, uh, there are some things we mean by that and some things we don't mean by that. Uh, protecting unity in the body of Christ doesn't mean that there will never be disagreements or conflict. It does not mean that. In fact, if a church uh, never experiences conflict, it's not doing anything for the Lord. Because when you try to make change to advance the kingdom, that produces friction. Now, the important thing is to handle conflict in a God-honoring way. But it doesn't mean you'll never have any disagreements or conflict. Christian unity doesn't mean uniformity, where everyone has to think exactly alike, dress alike, look alike, share all the same opinions and passions. No, that's not what it means. I read one time where somebody said, if two people are exactly alike, one of them isn't necessary. It's it's not uniformity. It does mean that there's a willingness to subordinate your wants and desires for the good of the church. If a church decision doesn't go the way that you had hoped it would go, you don't threaten to take your ball and go home. Being Christian and being unified together as the, as the body of Christ, as a Christian, uh, doesn't mean unity at all cost. It doesn't mean we're going to be unified, we don't want to rock the boat, so we're going to tolerate blatant sin it doesn't mean that in fact uh, jesus gives the church in matthew 18 a process for addressing sin with church discipline it does mean that there's a joyful willingness on the part of each member to follow accountable godly leadership knowing that your leaders are going to be held to, to account for their stewardship of leadership in this church. It does mean following godly, accountable leadership. That's unity. Now, there's some things that threaten church unity, and I'm, I'm going to only address two, but there, there are two important ones, I think. Number one is this, gossip. Gossip is a destructive force that's often at the center of disunity in the church. Proverbs 26.20 says, Without wood, fire goes out. Without gossip, conflict dies down. And so here's some things to remember when someone wants to share something with you uh, that may be gossip in nature. Number one, is it true? And by the way, these are important for you to think about before you pass something on as well. Is it true? And then number two, is it necessary for me to share this? Number three, does it concern the person that I'm about to share this with? You know what? If if everybody in the church would just decide, man, I am not going to be the source of gossip. I'm not going to receive it. I'm not going to pass it along. And if enough people in the church will say to someone who wants to pass along gossip, hey, wait, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. Have you talked to that person? Because before you share this with me, you need to go talk to that person. If that's the attitude of the people in the church, man, it won't take any time for gossip to dry up. It's just that important, brothers and sisters. 
And then this, another threat to unity is unforgiveness, an unforgiving heart. In in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, Paul writes, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Did you catch our motivation for forgiving each other? Our motivation isn't that they asked for it. Our motivation isn't, well, it didn't hurt or it wasn't any big deal. It may have been a big deal. It may have hurt. Our motivation for forgiving is that God has forgiven us in Christ. He's forgiven us. We're forgiven people, and forgiven people are now free to forgive others. Now, some of you all, all of us have gone through painful experiences, right? I mean, all of us have. But some of you all, maybe you've been carrying some stuff around in your life for a long time. Maybe somebody did something to you that they shouldn't have done, and it causes great pain in your life. Maybe you've carried it for years. It's possible that no one else knows about it even. Can I just encourage you that by the grace of God, you don't have to carry that anymore. You can choose to forgive. See, in the New Testament, that word forgive, it kind of comes out of the banking world where someone has incurred a debt with us by some hurtful word or deed, action. And it, and it, and, and it hurt. And it was wrong what they did. And they incurred a debt with us. And you and I have to make a choice. We're either going to harbor a grudge and let a root of bitterness take hold in our lives. By the way, roots are underground. You don't see them. And that's what happens when we harbor anger and bitterness. It becomes a root of bitterness in our lives. You can either hang on to that and and try to get revenge and be angry. You, You can choose to do that, but it's sort of like drinking poison and hoping it kills that person, right? You drinking the poison and hoping it kills that person. It never works. We can choose instead by the grace of God to forgive. Lord, what they did was wrong and it hurt and they're not repentant. They've never said they're sorry, but I choose to forgive them anyway because I've been forgiven. You you may pray a prayer or something like this. Father, I Would you forgive me for harboring anger and bitterness in my heart towards fill in the name with that person, fill in the blank with that person's name? Lord, would you forgive me? And Lord, I choose by your grace to forgive them, fill in the name. And I won't hold this against them anymore. That's a powerful prayer. But if that's you this morning, when we we have this response time, Again, you can tune me out right now if you need to have that conversation with your Father in Heaven. Now, reconciliation takes two. And, 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 and there are some people that maybe they hurt you and, and you, don't need to, you just don't need to be in their life anymore. Okay, I'm not saying that. It takes two to reconcile. But forgiveness you can choose to do on your own by the grace of God. Choose to forgive. Will you choose to forgive. And then just real quickly, here's some ways to foster unity in the church. Uh, Psalm 133, verse 1, how delightfully good when brothers live together in harmony. So here's really quick some things. Number one, work together. Row in the same direction. Everyone has their part. Do your part. Work together. Serve together. No one can do everything, but everyone can do something to show God's love to each other and to this community around you. Serve together. Be together. Make time to be with each other outside of the, the hour of worship or Sunday school. Make, 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 invite folks over to your house for, for supper or lunch. Uh, be together. Enjoy the koinonia, the fellowship of the believers. Man, if you genuinely love people, guess what? You're going to want to be with them. Work, be together. And then this grow together. 
Uh, you need each other in order to grow in the faith. And I would just, I'd make a plug here for Sunday school uh, in, in this church. Um, you, if that's your small group for getting together, studying the Word, and being connected, if you're not part of that, man, can I just really encourage you, find a, a, a Sunday school class to be involved in and plant your life. You know, I, I'll just say this. If someone, if, you're, if your only connection to the church is you come for one hour on Sunday morning, man, that's awesome. Glad you're here. But if you really want to get connected to this church, you're going to have to get involved in a small group. That's where it happens, where you start to meet people, and they get to know who you are, and you get to know who they are, and you start sharing each other's burdens. Man, you need that, and they need you. So get involved with a small group so that you can grow together. And then one final thought, and that's this. Share the good news together. And I'll tell you another quick story by Dan Garland, who pastored that church in Zion. He said that uh, he and his redneck relatives all went on a fishing trip one weekend. And uh, he said that it was a rough, it's a rough crowd, man. And he said it was raining like cats and dogs. And uh, he said they couldn't go out and fish. And so he said, all my redneck cousins, they're out in the front yard fist fighting in the mud. And then he said, but then the rain moved out and the sun came out and, and everybody started fishing together and everybody was happy. And he said, I, rem I learned a lesson about the church that day. Churches either fish or they fight. <laughs> they either fish or they fight. Man, that's what God's called us to, to get this gospel message out into the, the community and into the world. That's the mission. I'll talk more about that um, later this month. But, man, share the gospel together. Be on mission together. Some of y'all, maybe, like, if you live in the same neighborhood, you might need to say, hey, let's, let's prayer walk our neighborhood together. Let's do that somewhat regularly. And then you might take that next step and say, hey, let's go knock on some doors and just engage our neighbors and tell them we love them. Can we pray for you? Invite them to Easter Sunday service. You know it's coming up, right? There are people who are more open to church for some reason to come on Easter Sunday than, than a lot of other Sundays. Uh, but maybe, maybe you start to just get together and decide, man, God has sovereignly put our home, our family in this home, in this neighborhood for the purpose of extending the gospel to my neighbors. I'm going to give you a website that you would that I hope you'll consider. You may already know this. It's called blesseveryhome.com. Blesseveryhome.com. If you'll sign up for that, you can decide to get how many neighbors uh, delivered to an email to you every day. I get five neighbors Monday through Saturday, the names of five neighbors and their addresses. It's a little bit creepy when you think about it, but it, I enjoy getting it because I start praying. They give you a prayer to pray for your neighbors your lost neighbors, asking God to save them. Man, you start prayer walking, you think about that app. You can see where your neighbors live, and you can pray for them to be saved. That's a way to share the good news together. So as we land the plane here, let me just say this, that it, it's not possible for you and I to be serious about our calling as members of a church family First of all, if you don't have a relationship with God the Father. If you don't know Him, then this stuff really won't make a lot of sense to you. So the first step you need to take is to trust in Christ as your Lord and Savior. And as I said earlier, when we stand to sing, I'll be down front, others will come as well. And they would love to talk to you about what it means to know Jesus. But if you're a believer and this is your church, can I just invite you this morning as the, as the Lord leads, maybe to come up to the altar and, and pray for your search committee. Pray for the unity of this church. Pray that God would graciously help you to be a, a one who protects the unity of this church. Would you do that as we move into a time of, of invitation? Whatever that decision is, man, if God's leading you to come to the altar and pray, just obey Him, man. Follow that first prompt of the Spirit and let Him bless you. If you need the Lord, 
follow that prompt of the Spirit. We'll, we'll show you from the Scripture how you can be saved. If you're struggling with a hurt towards someone and, and forgiving them seems really nearly impossible, man, let us help you. Let some, let some other trusted brothers and sisters bear that burden with you and walk with you through that, through that pain. I don't know what the Lord's going to lead you to do, but can I just invite you, Burlington Baptist, at the first note that we sing together, you follow the Lord's leadership. And he'll bless you for it, I believe. Dear Lord, thank you so much for the word of God. It's a double-edged sword. It divides joint and marrow, soul and spirit, and judges the thoughts and attitudes of our heart. Thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you that, Father, we can put on the full armor of God, and that includes the sword of the spirit, the word of God. Lord, I pray that your spirit, as he speaks to every heart here, I pray that he would have complete sway. I pray that everybody that hears from the spirits this morning, that their first answer would be yes. Yes, Lord. God, would you do a work in our days that can only be explained as the living God in mercy showing up overwhelming us by your power and presence, causing people to repent of sin, causing relationships, Lord, that were once broken to be healed and mended, causing there to be a, a, a flame, a gospel flame burning in our hearts for lost people, Lord. Lord, would you help this good church to protect the unity of your bride called Burlington Baptist. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, would you stand with me? And you come this morning as the Lord leads you. You come. He is my heart, Lord. He is my
like Danny says, we've got the dollar club boxes and the offering boxes. Um, we've got the QR codes on the back of your seat if that's easier for you. Um, and just be in prayer for the Annie Armstrong offering in the anticipation of our Easter service. So I'm going to pray for us and we'll be dismissed. Dear Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you for Brother Andy's message. And I just thank you for every heart in this room. I just ask you to continue to lead us in our pastor search and in everything that this church does. I thank you for, for all the members and all the guests that we have. And I just pray that you would be with us throughout this week and um, lead us back to you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.